Today's workshop's about health and safety and the environment, and there's two areas that we're covering. The first are all the key items we feel that a manager should know about in terms of health and safety and the environment, and the second area is helping them with their associated assignments. If learners do need any more advice, they can contact their regional director. So I've worked for the BPIF for uh, just over two years and I cover the north, but I have been in health and safety for the last um, 17 years. So the briefing is to give you enough information about health and safety, uh, how it fits in with the regulatory framework and what Health and Safety at Work Act is. What we have is statutory duties, courts, civil claims, we have HSC and local authorities, sometimes they're called environmental health officers, um, but what they actually deal with more is food outlets and for offices. But you, from a factory point of view, the health and safety executive will be dealing with you straight away. We'll be looking at Health and Safety Work Act general duties and responsibilities. We'll be looking at a health and safety policy. This is something that you will need to go back to your site and have a look at your policy. We'll look at the law and regulations and we'll also look at risk assessments and the management regs. So criminal and civil action. Criminal is offence or breaches against the state. So anything that you do within your businesses, the HSE will come in and they will see whether there's a, a breach against the statute and then they will uh, take you for prosecution. So always the state against the offender and the investigation is done by the police. They will originally come in at the, the accident and then you will have the HSE come in. So what happens with the HSE is they will come, they will take photographs, they will take documents, they can take anything that they actually want to do. So you have no negotiation with it. They can either put a prohibition notice on you or an improvement notice. The other part of it is um, they've introduced fee for intervention. So it's at £124 an hour and they will charge you that from the minute they've come through that door. You cannot refuse them entry at all. You can't say, we're really, really busy. We're, you know, we've got to get this production out. We've got to get this order out. It's a case of, no, we're coming in. It's as simple as that. More often than not, they do ring, but they can just drop in. From a civil point of view, um, it's a breach of statutory duty. And it's always, uh, if there's been an accident, it's the employee that will bring that against the company. So what happens is there will be an investigation by the insurance company and, uh, for example, noise-induced hearing loss, that is the biggest one at the moment. You will be looking around £10,000 for these claims, compensation claims. From a criminal point of view, it's always prosecuted either through the magistrate's courts or a crown court. The magistrate's courts can up it up into a crown court. Now, if you are prosecuted under the magistrates, it's um, up to a £20,000 fine or six months imprisonment. If you're looking at a crown court, it's unlimited fines and two years imprisonment. Okay. And that's not just for the company. It could be for individual people, which I'll explain to you a little bit further on. Under criminal prosecution, it's beyond all reasonable doubt, and it's got to be so far as reasonably practical, that you have been negligent. And under civil, it comes from a county or a high court, and like I said, it's compensation claims. And you don't have to prove that they were, you were negligent. It's a case of, yes, they have noise-induced hearing loss, so your company will pay out for the compensation claim. This is why it's really, really strong that you have policies and procedures in place. So if you look at the Health and Safety Work Act, that is what we call an umbrella. And what it does, it allows the regulations to be made underneath it. They get changed. So what you will find is that the regulations will always follow back into the Health and Safety Work Act. So under that, you have HSE guidance and you have approved codes of practice as well. So health and safety legislation. So you have acts of parliament, you have the regulations underneath it, you have guidance notes. What I have brought is some guidance notes and approved codes of practice. Got the HSG 65, the six pack. If you follow these, you will more than likely meet the regulations, but you can also get prosecuted as well with these if you've followed it 
and not implement, uh, implemented it. General requirements under the Health and Safety Work Act, there are specific ones. So there's the Management of Health and Safety Work Act Regulations 1999, noise, first aid, manual handling. With health and safety law is, you're innocent until proven guilty. But under Health and Safety Work Act, you're not, you're guilty straight away. All right, and you've got to prove your innocence. So you've got to have all your policies and procedures. It's no good having them there, and then it's a case of, well, they're on a shelf, nobody knows about them. You know, you have to drive them through. So absolute. So there's no negotiation with it. You have to do it. Practicable and reasonable practicable. Section two is where you start with your policy statements. You've got to have a safe place of work, safe environment. We've got to look at safe storage, handling, use and transport. You've got to look at your employees, so information, instruction and training. You've got to make sure that you have welfare facilities, so toilet facilities, drinking facilities. So the health and safety policy, everybody got one? Everybody read it? Yes? From front to back. You've wrote it. Why have you wrote it if you've not read it? You know, you need to get that down onto that shop floor. Got to make sure that you have safe plant machinery and equipment. So this is a case of making sure that machinery that's coming in is fully guarded. Um, that yes, it is CE marked, but also that it meets the pure regs. Your health and safety policy is all in three sections. It has a statement of intent, which comes straight from section two of your health and safety work act. It the, has an organisation arrangement which explains what everybody's roles and responsibilities are in health and safety. So that comes from the chief exec right down to the employees, to fire wardens, first aiders. And it shows how you manage the hazards within your business. Has to be published so you can see it on a notice board and it ho has to be revised and it has to be down on that shop floor. It's no good handing it to them and saying, sign, that, sign a date that to say you've received it. They have to understand it because this is something where if there is an accident, you're going to be picking your risk assessments up and your policies to make sure that they follow procedures. Under Health and Safety Work Act, you have a duty to consult with the employees. So the only way to do it really is to have a health and safety committee, a mixture of managers and employees. It's no good having it management heavy. Get that information off the shop floor, all right? Because at the end of the day, they're working with it and they know what's best. So these are examples of prosecutions crushed with a reversing vehicle. We've also got a um, cutting and creasing machine and we've also got falls from high. And again, this was because there was no safe systems of work and no risk assessments. Hand trap between two rollers, poor guarding. Common sense, would we put our fingers in there? You'd go, no, but actually it's still happening. But if you, if you catch them, then it's a case of you stop it there and then. And you, and you are very firm to say that that isn't going to happen and you reiterate to everybody the company policy. It's good to take a section out of that policy just to keep refreshing them that this is not what we do. But if it happened again, then that would be your choice to say, right, I'm going down the disciplinary route. What I wouldn't expect you to do is just keep saying, you don't do that, you don't do that, you don't do that because that won't stand up in, in court at all. Under Section 7 of the Health and Safety Work Act, it's an employee's duty to take reasonable care of their own health, safety and that of others that may be affected by their acts and omissions. They've got to cooperate with the employer and they've got to comply with the duties. If you have um, a contractor on site, then they can also drop into this. So anything that your employees do that could affect the contractor, but also the contractor affecting the employees. Just for you to be aware, managers can also get prosecuted under this. Employees duties, section eight. It's an offence for anyone to intentionally or recklessly interfere with or misuse anything provided in the interest of health and safety or welfare. So this is designed to look at guarding on your machinery. So if you are allowing for your machinery 
to have guarding taken off, then you can get prosecuted under Section 2 because you're not keeping a safe working environment. Section 37 extends uh, corporate liability for health and safety. So this is to do with directors, managers, company secretaries. So if you know that things are happening on the shop floor or you say, well, I didn't know that that would happen, then unfortunately it doesn't happen. You can get prosecuted under Section 37. Fresher Bakeries was trading as harvest time and they decided to save some money and they brought the maintenance of the ovens in-house rather than having it outside. Uh, but the ovens had to be cooled down for 12 hours. But management decided after two hours that it was fine to go in and do the maintenance on uh, the ovens. So they tested it at both ends, fine. They hadn't checked the core temperature of the oven, which was 100 degrees. Uh, there's a conveyor belt that they go in. Uh, two guys went in. Uh, the conveyor belt only went one way, and it took 17 minutes for it to go from one end to the other. And it, it's, it's just horrendous to think that guys would turn around and say, yeah, I'll go in after two hours. Your employees can turn around to you and say, I'm not doing that because it's unsafe. I'll do it another way, all right? And, and you should accept that. Fresher bakeries were fined £250,000, harvest time £100,000. The MD was fined individually £20,000 plus £5,000 costs. Uh, production director was £1,000 and the chief engineer was £2,000 because they were knew about it, they knew they'd made that decision that it was two hours was enough. There are certain accidents that need to be reported, certain diseases, industrial diseases, and especially in, in this uh, industry, we're looking at contact dermatitis. And then there's near misses, uh, you know, like walls collapsing or overturned vehicles and things like that. So what happens with the management regs is it's very, very specific and it's formed with 30 regulations. Now, the main one that you need to know about is Regulation 3, and that is companies have to do a risk assessment. And under the um, management regs, you've got to plan, you've got to organise your business, you've got to control the hazards within it, and you've got to monitor and you've got to review them. The other information that you need to look at is that you provide information, instruction and training, that you also provide risk assessments for pregnant women. Now, uh, as soon as you find out that you have a pregnant worker, then you have to carry out a risk assessment on them. You also need to do a risk assessment on young persons. Now, there's two lots of young persons. There's under 18s and there's under 16s. You need to be very, very specific with your risk assessments of what they can and what they can't do. This is one of the areas that I need you to get your head around because if you don't, you will never get your head around risk assessments at all. The definition of a hazard is something that can cause harm and the risk is the likelihood of it happening. So when you get on the shop floor, have a look what the hazards are, decide who can be harmed and then evaluate the risk, high, medium or low. You record that information and then you review it. The other thing that you need to know about risk assessments is it doesn't go in a folder, it doesn't go on the shelf and it doesn't get forgotten. It has to be communicated to the lads on that shop floor. Get them to sign it and date it to say that they've read and understood all those control measures. This is something that you need to think about and it's a good acronym, ERIC PD. So when you look at risk assessments, you're looking at elimination all the time. Can we eliminate that hazard? Do we actually need it? If we can't eliminate it, can we reduce it? If we can't reduce it, can we isolate it? And then we go down C as a control measure. If we can't get any of those, then PPE is your last resort. And if we don't get any of those, if they ignore all of those, we're gonna go down a disciplinary route. Cautious control of substances hazardous to health and um, you're looking at dust, vapour, fumes or mist. It could be contact with eyes or skin, it could be inhalation through your lungs, absorption through skin, ingestion. The hazard symbols have changed. 
just because we've gone global, all right? Originally, we just covered Europe, but now we've gone global. So they decided to change it from that to a diamond shape. So the only thing really that's majorly changed is where it was an irritant, it's now gone to the exclamation mark. We've got the middle one is contains gas under pressure and the last one is carcinogenic. So it's cancerous and it affects the internal structure. Make sure that you have a fire risk assessment and it has to be suitable. The fire authority have gone on their own now, so uh, they can prosecute you know, the same as the HSE. So I suggest you go back to your business and have a look at your fire risk assessment. If it's a yes and a no, and that's it, then you haven't got a suitable fire risk assessment. You really need to make sure that you're saying how you manage that hazard. You know, are you making sure that you are Checking your alarm system on a weekly basis and it covers all your shift. Checking that you have your fire extinguishers on a yearly basis, that your emergency lighting is checked on a monthly basis and then on a six monthly basis that somebody comes in from an outside source and checks that they have a three hour rundown. So when you look at any fire, you're looking at the fire triangle. So you need any one of those to have a fire, heat, oxygen and fuel, okay? 70% of businesses that have a fire do not reopen, all right? And subsequently fail within three years, all right? PPE, personal protective equipment. It's your last resort, and I mean your last resort. Under the Health and Safety Work Act, you have to provide it. If you are stating it in your risk assessment, you have to provide it. But the worst one is steel toe caps. It's a case of, if you've said it in your risk assessment, there is no negotiation, they were it. And they can't come to you and say, I've got bunions or I've got a foot problem or whatever. They're gonna wear it. With PPE, you have to provide information, instruction and training on how to use it. Don't rely on, it's a pair of goggles, it's a hair protection. It's easy to put in, it's not. Hearing protection is, I think, out of all of them, the hardest one, because you've got to pull the back of the ear and make sure that the canal's open before you actually insert it. Some of them are a roll up as well. So if you don't have that right, and it's 85 decibels and it's mandatory, with your audiometry testing, you could pick up that your control measures are not right if the hearing protection goes down as well, okay. Uh, HSG65 is a very good management um, for health and safety. It's, this is the new format, all right? It's very, very good for your business on how you manage it. And it's gone to a plan, do, check and act. I brought it here so that you can have a quick flick through and see how it works. But again, it's looking at your policy, your organisation, how you control it, how you monitor it and how you review it. There's also the BPIF health check. Depending on what level that you are at, if you're 82% and above, then you can go for seal of excellence. Now this is in line with the 18,001, but the difference is you've got to demonstrate that on that shop floor. 18,001 is a very, very good system for health and safety, but you can have non-conformances and so long as you've recorded that information, then you've actually uh, conformed to it. And whereas I said, the seal of excellence is, you've got to make sure that you're doing that on the shop floor. Happy, healthy workforce. That's all I can say about health and safety. It's not something that's addition. It's a bolt on and it does work and if everybody understands what they're doing <coughs> then you are reducing your accident statistics, your time investigating it, your raw materials will not be damaged, your finished products won't be damaged, your maintenance on your machines will be running all the time if you do it but you've got to embrace it. Good afternoon, welcome to uh, the session on the environment. I'm the commercial products manager of the BPIF uh, and as part of that role I've been managing the BPIF's 
climate change levy reduction scheme since its inception in 2000. Uh, I've also managed the BPI's carbon footprinting tool and will be auditing that tool uh, when it goes online later this year. And I've also managed the various BPI of energy purchasing schemes that we've run. Right, I thought I'd start with um, a couple of definitions. The, the assignment talks about environment and sustainability. The environment is everything uh, that, that surrounds us. Sustainability creates and maintains the conditions under which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony that permit fulfilling the social, economic and other requirements of present and future generations. So basically what it's saying is, how do we keep our standards of living? How do we progress further? How do we allow developed countries to develop further without buggering up everything, without messing the environment? So that's what sustainability is about. And put simply, we're putting gases in the air, we're, uh, we're putting um, pollutants into the air as well, we're putting pollutants into the land, uh, chemicals, uh, we're putting chemicals into the sea, we're dumping waste in the sea, we're dumping waste into the land, and then we're taking things out of the land. We're taking trees out, uh, we're taking raw materials out. And we've done this forever, haven't we? But the problem is we're now doing it, there's billions of us doing it, and we're doing it on an industrial level. And that's the issue that's creating, uh, creating the problem for sustainability. Uh, we're increasing greenhouse gases, producing acid rain, um, causing deforestation, depletion of raw materials, um, polluting the air and water, and increasing waste. And that's con that has consequences. Increases in global temperatures, more severe weather events, reducing biodiversity. Greenhouse gas gases rose from aviation between 1990 and 2006 by 87%. That's in an era when we're trying, we're actually, a lot of the developed countries are actually have agreements to reduce greenhouse gases. And there are measurables. Sea levels are rising at three millimetres a year. Ice caps are melting at unprecedented levels. It seems to be that uh, scientific opinion is, is, is actually starting to agree on the yes side that we are having an influence on, our, on, our, uh, on the environment. And things have improved, haven't they? Except, have they? Um, isn't London at the moment being fined by the EU for having too high uh, of, of pollution in the air? The World Health Organization estimates that at the moment, at the moment this is, one in eight deaths is due to air pollution. For those of you that attended the customer service workshop, you'll remember me from there. And one of the things I said then was, when you're learning uh, to, uh, to, to deliver training, they always say put up a page to establish your credentials. You might remember I worked for a company in telecoms. Um, I was a former director there. And we were the first, joint first company in the UK to achieve, should say, BS7750, which is now ISO 14001 and EMAS. Um, I was the director responsible for the environment for the company. And unfortunately, I got the title as, as a WAG. Um, because uh, I was selected by the government to be an advisor when they were putting in the uh, WE regulations into, this, uh, into the UK legislation. As a result of that as well, I was also asked to sit on um, the United Nations project group, uh, which we created some international guidelines for the reuse and recycling of mobile phones. And since joining the BPIF four years ago, um, I've helped a number of our members achieve ISO 14001 and EMAS. What my objectives are today, first off, is to help you with ideas on how you might complete the optional assignment. Secondly, to provide, whilst I'm doing that, provide a, a practical insight how you might go about setting up a, an environmental management system or if I get asked into a member how I do set up an environmental management system for them. So, First of all, on the moral side, as I said, Steve has been over this, but I'm just going to ask you, can you name the five different types of pollution? Noise is yeah. one. Air is another. Water. Water. Soil. Land, yep. Yeah. And one more. It's radioactive. And what are considered to be the ten major pollutants in the world? CO2, DDT, which is insecticide, lead, carbon monoxide, sulphur dioxide, which we got oil, we got nitrogen oxide, we got radiation, mercury and phosphate. We'll, we'll look at the legal case. So what I've got here 
is three recent actual environmental court cases. So Regal Rank sent hazardous waste to be processed at a waste disposal site in Middlesbrough. Uh, the site in Middlesbrough was not licensed to process hazardous waste. Regal Rank had no previous offences. Regal Rank admitted the charge but claimed they didn't know, claimed ignorance. Put your hands up if you think that the outcome was well, one formal warning in order to clear waste from the site. Number two, if you think number two is the correct one. So, one, two, okay. And so the last two tables, the last one. Okay, so the answer was number two. And the Environment Agency said, as a business, Regal Rank has a duty to ensure that any waste they deal with goes only to fully legitimate and regulated sites. So I guess the message there for you guys are, are all your waste streams going to legitimate and re regulated sites. Legal case number two, which was 19th of May this year. So quite a long one. Put your hands up, outcome one. Hands up if you think it was outcome two. One T. Hands up if you think it was outcome three. Okay, and hands up if you think it was outcome four. Three team. Right, the outcome was three. And the Environment Agency said that environmental permits are important because they help safeguard the environment and human health. And the question for, for everyone here is, do you have the correct permits? Um, I recently did, under European funding, 10 audits for our members, and half of them didn't have the correct permit, so technically they were in breach. Right, and final case, 14th of May this year. Hands up if you think that Slingsby was acquitted and Spencer was fined 20,000. Number two. Number three. <laughs> and number four. Everyone. The outcome was number four, correct, well done. An environment agency said this prosecution demonstrates that we take waste crime very seriously and will not hesitate to prosecute if necessary uh, in order to protect the environment and local communities. And I guess the message there is that um, under the Duty of Care Act you are responsible for your waste. Even when you give it to one of your authorised companies to take away, it's still your responsibility. Even whatever they do with it, it's still your responsibility. Okay, so we're just going to talk about um, environmental offences in printing. So some of the wastes that I come across um, for printing could cause what's called a Category 2 offence, and a category denotes the impact that the offence could have on the environment. Using the definitive guidance for a Category 2 offence, a deliberate one for a company with a turnover of between 2 and 10 million, the starting point is a £45,000 fine, but they can range, depending on the actual particulars, between 17 and 170,000 pounds. And a deliberate category two offence for an individual is a one-year custody um, starting point with a range of between 26 weeks and 18 months custody. Right, so that was the legal side. So let's have a look at the economic case. So first of all, one of the benefits is to reduce your costs of purchasing. Also, from the actual amount of waste you're generating, the cost of disposal will be less. Um, if you then look at your waste streams and actually recycle them more effectively, then you can increase your revenues. You can have reduced energy costs, <coughs> reduced insurance premiums, um, improved chances of future investments or your sale of business, uh, a decrease in the likelihood of an accident or an incident. And if you do have an accident or if there's an incident occurs, because you might have emergency procedures, then you'll minimise the impact on the actual environment. So probably the most important thing is your brand image. Uh, and that was a picture of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill from satellite. And as you can see, um, what happened to BP share price after the, uh, the oil spill. OK, so let's go back to the actual assignment and uh, look at the first assessment criteria. It says, explain why environmental sustainability is a strategic is issue 
in the context of the organisation purpose and activities. So what you could do is you could just explain, well, why, why is the environment important for your particular company? What kind of environmental things or practices does your company do and why do they do it? And you could include the moral versus legal versus economic argument that I've just talked about. Uh, you could also include what's called, which is often used, um, the three spheres of sustainability, which I won't go into, but it's as simple as that, that first assessment criteria. It's basically talking about why it's important for your company, the environment. If you remember, Linda this morning was talking about Plan Do Check Act for health and safety. It's also Plan Do Check Act is the quality standard and it's also environmental standard is based upon that principle. I have 12 questions that I ask when I go into a, a company to try and help set them up their environmental management system. So these are the 12 questions. What is your stance or what is our stance on the environment? So what is your policy? How does your company interact with the environment? In order to answer that, I'll do, for example, an audit or a baseline review, which I'll talk about a bit more later. The next question is, well, which one of these, or which of these interactions is most likely to harm the environment, and by how much? When you know what your interactions are, then you can start to understand, well, what are the laws associated with those activities and emissions? And how are we currently managing those activities and interactions? And are these systems adequate, or do we need to do something else? How else could we improve our environmental performance? What else do we want to do which is in addition to what we have to do legally? What if something goes wrong? What emergency procedures do we have in place? What about our in indirect impact on the environment through our suppliers? So we use certain suppliers and they might cause an, um, or they will have an impact on the environment. Do we consider that? Do we have the right training in place? So, um, I often go to companies and they've got emergency spillage kits and I say, oh, who's the trained person to actually use those? Oh, training? No, you have to have training, we've just got the kit. How do we communicate environmental policy, our actions, both internally to our staff, but also externally to our other stakeholders? What monitoring systems and processes do we have in place? And by answering or asking and going through the 12 questions, you can then start to build someone's environmental management system up. OK, moving on to the next assessment criteria. It says, review current legislative requirements and codes of practice associated with environmental sustainability that impact on the organisation. The question is, how do I interact with the environment? So land, air, water and noise. So therefore, you don't tend to have radioactive here. Then you can just split it out into land, air, water and noise and think, well, how, you know, what are the things that our company does and what kinds of, you know, emissions are there in land? So, for example, solid waste, liquid waste, packaging waste, general waste, we, so electronic waste, hazardous, non-hazardous, air, things like uh, solvents, inks, other volatile organic, organic compounds. If you have um, air conditioning systems in your um, company, you know, there's a piece of legislation called the F-Gas regs, um, water and noise. So what I'll do is I'll go into a company and I'll just map that out for them. If you're writing your assignment, you can do that yourself. Once you then know what your emissions are, you can think, well, what are the laws associated with those emissions? The next section is evaluate the organisation's current environmental sustainability strategy, policy or standards and recommend improvements to the organisation's current environmental s sustainability strategy, policy or standards. The easiest way is to say, OK, let's have a look at an extract from ISO 14001, which says what should be in a company's environmental policy if you're going to get certificated to ISO 14001. So evaluation is basically comparing what it should have in it to what it does have in it. And if, there's, if it has got some of those things missing, then as part of the next section, you can rec recommend that it includes those pieces. So actually, although it looks quite complicated, it's actually quite straightforward. So the next sections are, first of all is undertake an environmental audit or baseline environmental audit using an appropriate methodology in your own area of responsibility to improve environmental performance. And after you've done that, produce a formal post-audit report comprising evaluation of findings, recommendations, action plan, and monitoring and review techniques used to maintain improvements. First of all, environmental policy. Do we have one? Is it appropriate? 
Are all employees aware of it? Is it available to the public? So this could be the basis of your audit, as it were. Legislation. Do we have a system for checking we are complying with legislation? If we don't, then actually one of my recommendations, or as part of your assignment, your recommendations is actually we don't have a very good system for checking, you know, do we comply with environmental legislation? We don't update it. We, you know, we, we did it once four years ago, but we haven't done anything since. Licenses and permits. Local authority environmental permit, hazardous waste producer, permit to discharge, and noise, registrations, packaging waste regulations, you know, if you produce over 50 tonnes, weave regulations, CRC, and then wastes. What are your different waste streams? Who are waste contractors? Do they have the correct licences? Do they complete the correct paperwork um, once they take our waste away? Do you keep your waste transfer notes for a minimum of two years, which is a legal requirement, or three years for any hazardous waste? Could we recycle more, perhaps? Storage. Do we have suitable storage areas for when we buy new chemicals? Do we have sto suitable storage areas for wastes? Are those storage areas bunded? Is it in accordance to our COSH risk assessments or COSH survey? Maintenance. Do we service our machines? Do we service our vehicles? Do we have um, our air conditioning um, system serviced. A site plan. Do we have a site plan? Do we have a drainage plan? Do they show surface water drains, sewer drains? Are they colour coded? Any sense of emergencies? Do we have procedures? Are people trained? Do we have emergency spillage kits? Do we have emergency drain barriers? Have we signed up for any voluntary schemes? For example, PEFC, FSC, ISO 14001, EMAS, etc. And do we consider the environment when choosing our suppliers? but that should give you enough guidance if you do decide to do that particular assignment to complete it fairly simply. Right, I briefly wanted to take you through uh, some of the government's energy policies, mainly because the UK has signed itself up to some severe greenhouse gas emissions targets. It needs to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2050, way above the Kyoto targets. So they have four main policies uh, in order to reduce energy consumption, UK PLC reduce energy consumption, or to improve energy efficiency. ESOS is the, is the latest one, it's the Energy Saving Opportunity Scheme. For larger companies, those who are greater than small and medium sized enterprises, more than 250 employees, have to conduct an energy uh, audit every four years. The EU Emissions Trading Scheme uh, is a scheme for the really large energy producers, uh, anybody with a greater than 20 megawatt boiler capacity, and basically, um, you calculate how much energy you use, what you convert that into carbon, uh, tons of carbon with government conversion factors, and then pay a tax on it. CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme is something that came out in 2008. But again, it's for larger companies. It's aimed at any company, including all their sites, who use more than 6 million kilowatt hours uh, of energy a year. So those are three mandatory government schemes uh, for, for the larger companies. The climate change agreements uh, are a little different. Uh, they're not mandatory, it's voluntary. What it states is that if you join a climate change, or you have a climate change agreement with the government, uh, then you're able to reduce the, the climate change levy that's on everybody's energy bills. Every company in the UK since 2001, I think, has had a climate change levy on the bill. And a, and a printing company is eligible and it can claim a 90% reduction uh, on the climate change levy for, um, for electricity and 65% uh, for gas. So what else does the BPF do in the environmental side? Well, we run an energy purchasing scheme. Um, we've run a few of these um, through the years. Uh, the, the one we're running at the moment is with Schneider Electric. It's quite useful to use a broker, to use an intermediary, because they keep their eye on where the prices are going. Now, climate calc is something new that we're going to be bringing out in the autumn. We've always run a carbon footprinting tool, but this one is going to go online. The difference between this and what we've done before and other carbon footprinting tools is that it takes information that's gathered from Europe and enables you to differentiate in areas that are specific to our industry. It enables you to use different uh, grades of paper, different plates, different inks. So not only will you be able to get a carbon footprint for your company, you'll be able to get a carbon footprint for an individual product, but you'll also be able to talk to your customer on the phone and say, hey, if you use a different paper, then you can reduce it. 
If you use different inks, if you use different plates, it's not just about price. If you want to reduce your carbon footprinting, how about using this, uh, this sort of paper and it will reduce it by this much. But the other thing, of course, is that the use of the paper uh, is one of the reasons that the industry is, tr uh, is treated as being the, um, the environmental bogeyman. And the BPIF and others uh, have come together in the two sides campaign uh, in order to try and put the other side to it. We don't cause deforestation. Most deforestation is caused by unsustainable uh, agricultural practices, chopping down trees to get more cattle in. And out of the uh, world's wood harvest, it's only 11% of it uh, is used for the paper and printing industry. And the other thing to say is that wood is a fully renewable and sustainable resource, unlike other fossil fuels. You can plant more trees. You can't plant more oil. The alternatives aren't environmentally neutral either. Electronic waste is growing three times faster than any other waste. Reading a newspaper consumes 20% less carbon than reading uh, a newspaper online for 20 minutes. The essence of the Two Sides campaign is that print and paper is based on wood, which is natural and a renewable resource that's recycled. And surely in a multimedia world, that's the sustainable way to communicate.